As long as trading cards have been around, so has the hobby of collecting them. Trading cards roots date back to trade cards, which were a form of advertising in the 1800s. 19th century companies took to the streets to distribute these promotional cards by hand. These trade cards featured an image on one side, usually places, American presidents, animals or comic characters, and the company's details on the other. The card's potential as a promotional tool was clear and more and more companies began producing them. A New York sporting goods company, Peck & Snyder, issued a card featuring a baseball club. This 1868 trade card is renowned as the first true baseball card. With all the variations in circulation, it was only natural that people began collecting these cards in earnest, and so a hobby was born. In 1886, Goodwin and Company began to pack cards featuring baseball players with their cigarettes to stiffen the packet and protect their product. With over 2,000 cards, it became the first major set of baseball cards. The practice was so successful that other companies followed suit, and soon tobacco cards became an industry standard to survive in a highly competitive market. Within a matter of years, the industry consolidated to the point that one large player emerged, the American Tobacco Company. With no serious competition left after acquiring over 200 small companies, there was little need for tobacco cards as a promotional tool. The U.S. government started dismantling the tobacco giant in 1907, and a highly competitive market returned in short order. Tobacco cards were back in full swing by 1911, and collectors got back in the game, marking the beginning of an incredible journey. Before it was relegated to the pages of history, the American Tobacco Company produced what would become a landmark set in the history of baseball card collecting, the T-206. With 523 different cards featuring amazing color lithographs of baseball legends, this set is famous for containing the most valuable card in history, the Honus Wagner, valued at over $2 million. Uh, I guess the earliest cards that have been attached to our industry up to now is uh, is back to 1910. That baseball is always kind of the leader when it comes to creation of new stuff, and at, at that time, baseball was going through a huge phase in in, uh, in the states, and uh, tobacco companies uh, jump on that baseball phase and start putting uh, baseball cards inside cigarette packs. And in 1910, there was the creation of the new National Hockey Association, which was a pre-NHL uh, pre uh, league. And you had some stars, for example, 1910-11 set, uh, and they're much smaller cards uh, than what we have today. And uh, there, there was a rookie cards of, for example, Art Ross, uh, Lester Patrick. Uh, that's where basically, uh, Card companies like Imperial Tobacco decided to do a bit the same thing like they did in baseball and put those cards in cigarette packs. In 1922, a hockey card set was produced featuring the rookie cards of immortal NHL legends such as King Clancy, Cy Denny, Aurel Joliet, and Howie Morenz. But these 40 cards, known as the William Patterson V145-1 set, is not only famous for containing these incredible cards, it also produced one of the rarest trading cards of all, the Burt Corbo card. With only a few known in existence, this short print card is seen as the holy grail of hockey cards. The hobby was further revolutionized in the 1930s thanks to bubble gum. Chewing gum companies started to produce trading cards in great numbers during the Great Depression, leading the way to trading cards as we know them today. An Ontario-based chewing gum company started what would become a big part of their business, the Opeechee trading cards. 
The Topps Chewing Gum Company printed its first baseball card set in 1951, and within a matter of years, they were printing cards related to all four major pro sports, including hockey, basketball, and football. In 1957, Topps established a standard that has come to define the look of the hobby. It printed a card that measured two and a half inches by three and a half inches, the size of the modern card. Armed with exclusive rights to produce baseball cards with chewing gum, Topps dominated the baseball card market right up until 1980, when a famous court ruling opened the door to new players, such as Score and Upper Deck. A new era was born. The, the, the change of the marketplace of the card industry up to a point changed with the, 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 the internet and the, with the creation of online businesses and, and the creation of eBay. Uh, so it was all kind of a, a big, uh, a, a big change, and the card industry got, got was what was right and, uh, in the middle of all this. And, and as people were were buying and selling online more and more, uh, everything was done through raw raw grades, or raw cards. So so that created an opportunity for 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 for, for a company to potentially become a third-party grader. So there was, uh, PSA was one of the first ones that started. There was also Beckett that got involved and there was maybe two or four others. And um, the one that survived and thrived over the, the, the last 20 years and 15, 20 years is a PSA that's now the, the number one in terms of market share. And I would, I would probably guess that they easily have 60, 70% market share or if not more.